Alexis Bunton here. I co-direct the Indigeneity program with Bioneers. And today I'm talking to Danielle Hill. And Danielle Hill is a citizen of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, which is located in Mashpee, which is on Cape Cod, which is prime, prime country. <laughs> and um, the Wampanoag tribe, uh, for yeah. those of you who don't know, this is the tribe that the pilgrims met when they came 400 years ago, literally this year to this year in 1620. And those, those, they are the tribe that you hear about in Thanksgiving stories. And just recently on March 27th, the federal government through the BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, put out an announcement to the tribe that they would be disestablishing your reservation land. And this is really remarkable because our federal government has actually upheld acknowledging the existence and the federal recognition of the, and the acknowledgement that the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe has existed um, since before the American government. So can you tell me what disestablishment means and what people can do about it? Disestablishment hasn't been done um, by the Department of the Interior since the termination error. Uh, it's only been done one other time. And so essentially it means that um, the Department of the Interior is attempting to take away our 321 acres of land um, and take it out of federal trusts. And so this means that we as a tribal sovereign entity will not have the ability to govern ourselves and our tribal citizens on our own land. So this is something that is just, um, it's, taken, uh, it's taken us all aback because obviously it's coming in the middle of this um, COVID epidemic. So not only are tribal citizens, you know, and tribal families dealing with trying to keep their, their families healthy and safe and protected, but now um, we have to also kind of process this news and it's really affecting us on a, you know, this for all of us collectively. So that's where we're at uh, today. Yeah, and you just mentioned the termination era, and I think this is something that everybody should learn in high school, but they don't. And the termination era was more than 60 years ago, but I know my, my um, parents were of age at that time, and the termination era was in the 19, uh, 50s and 60s, and it's when the federal government sought to take away the tribal status of U.S. tribes, basically a way to assimilate Native people into the mainstream American society, um, to take away their culture, uh, take away their rights as peoples who existed before the establishment of the USA. And um, thankfully that policy was stopped, but I mean, for this to happen, 60 years again later, it's, uh, it's, we look back on that time as so shocking. How can you take away people's tribal identity when we were here before America was even a country? So for this to happen right now, it's, it's pretty alarming, right? I agree. Um, specifically, the Wampanoag Nation has had a really long history, um, starting in 1620 you know, when the pilgrims, they established their colonies on Wampanoag land in Plymouth, Massachusetts. So as you mentioned before, um, this has been an ongoing battle for our tribe and 2020 actually marks the 400th um, anniversary, some people are calling it, but um, it's really not something to be celebrated given this news, but it's the 400th anniversary of their arrival. And since 1620, all the way until 2020, we have been battling with the King of England. We have been battling with the state of Massachusetts. We have been battling with the federal government to prove over and over and over again that we are a, a native nation. We are sovereign people. We are Indians. Um, and we have a right to our land that we have always been on. 
Um, and so to me, this is more about, um, it's just the continual encroachment of, of these invaders, of the colonists, that is really what's happening. I, and I just think it's such a remarkable testament to your tribe's resilience, that you're here, you're alive, you still have people in your community still practice your traditional beliefs and ways of life on your actual ancestral lands, which is so amazing given that history, it almost gives me the chills. And um, I've been looking into, um, I've been reading primary documents and learning about what happened during that first Thanksgiving. And um, one thing that I learned was that the pilgrims actually settled on an abandoned Wampanoag village and the reason it was abandoned and empty for them to take is because prior to the pilgrims arriving, there were European traders up and down the eastern seaboard, fur traders, fishermen, that passed on disease pandemics <laughs> that the tribe experienced. And right. so, you know, more than 90% of the people died and the village was abandoned and the pilgrims saw, oh, this is great. The trees are cleared. It's in a safe place. It's in the right place. So it's, it's, it's not ironic, <laughs> but it's sort of, it's history repeating itself, this happening right now. There's some kind of a repeating metaphor. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's really powerful um, and probably one of the largest examples of how history repeats itself. And, and the way that can be interpreted is like, I think, you know, actions and circumstance wants to give wants to be given the chance to prove itself correct and this to me keeps happening over and over again because the outcomes are, have never been corrected the outcomes always are rooted in some level of um greed uh, uh patriarchy uh colonization capitalism you know it's always rooted in something to benefit really one one group of people and this is the opportunity um, for our nation, native and non-native, to actually correct this happening for the first time, you know, to there, I feel like the the government is not is doing exactly what it did before. But if we can stop it soon enough, or if more people can um, understand the facts and and encourage our 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 leaders our senators to actually for once um do what is right you know give native tribes you know give the wampanoag people our land i mean you we agreed upon that we would be sovereign nations like let's just uphold that agreement for once and let us govern ourselves and trust us and trust the process and you know protect us and and let's attempt to be progressive and live harmoniously and equal and fair. I mean, if we don't do this right, then in another 400 years or not even that long, this will happen over and over again. You know, I just, patterns are not just arbitrary happenings in our lives. They want to be corrected. So that's, that's my take on why this keeps happening to us. And I, I want to pick up on some of the threads that you just mentioned. Um, how is this related to a larger theme of capitalism? How is this related to a larger theme of social justice? And you didn't say it, but I'll say it, white supremacy in this country. Um, but I, I want to just, for people who aren't aware of what sovereignty is, um, I just want to briefly mention that sovereignty um, is an idea that came about when nationalism first became a thing. We didn't used to have organized nation states until basically um, during and after the Middle Ages. So a lot of the countries we know in Europe today, many of them weren't established until 100, 200, 300 years ago. And people just don't know that. But in international law, um, countries recognize each other through treaties and they recognize each other's ability to have govern their self-govern their own territories. So when colonizers came to the United States and wanted to make new lands, they recognized that each distinct tribe was like 
was its own nation that self-governed, had its own set of rules, its own economy, its own international relations with other tribes in America. So that's why treaties were made. Treaties were imported from Europe and European ideas of countries dealing with each other. So what it means to be sovereign is that tribes are literally their own nation that self-govern within the United States. And that idea has been grandfathered all the way through first contact to now. So um, again, de-establishing your reservation, which threatens your tribal sovereignty, it's like England going over to France and saying, no, you're not your own country anymore we're just gonna move in here and do things our ways. That's how morally wrong it is. But um, before I get into those other themes of capitalism and social justice, I, what can people do right now to stand up to this? Well, we do have a campaign going where uh, we're encouraging everybody to write letters to their senators. Um, there is a bill that was passed by the, um, the House of Representatives called HR 312, and that is to uh, reaffirm the Mastery Wampanoag reservation lands. And so that is sitting on the Senate calendar, um, and we are unsure of when it will be brought to the floor and when it will be voted upon. So we really need everybody to shed light on this issue and push our um, elected officials to do their job and do what is right and vote in favor of this, this bill. There's also another bill um, on the floor that will also help not only our tribe but all tribes and that is the Carcieri fix and that is um, HR 372. And so um, that will help uh, pretty much lock in um, tribes' efforts to put land into trust um, after the arbitrary date of 1934. Yes. So we're hoping that everybody can just start with the letter writing campaign and also tell a neighbor, tell a friend, and just spread the news, spread this issue um, around, you know, just let everybody know what's going on. Can you repeat, I had a little bit of noise distraction. Can you repeat the Carcieri fit, the name of that one again? Yes, so we, there is a bill on the floor um, that is called the Carcieri Fix and it's HR 372. And what that will do is that will help not only the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, but all tribes um, to acquire land into trust. Right now there's essentially um, an arbitrary date that tribes have to prove their federal jurisdiction, um, and that's 1934. And that is essentially a big, a big roadblock for tribes who have had special circumstances or relationships or, or um, documented relations with the federal gov government, but not necessarily having been under federal jurisdiction. Um, but they still were tribes and they were still treated like tribes, but that is prohibiting them from getting land into trust. And so that is the situation that we are also in. So the two bills will help um, all tribes acquire land and continue their sovereign status. Yeah, and just to kind of bring this, to kind of reiterate what you're saying, I live in California now and we have a number of tribes in California. There was a treaty that went to, that was supposed to go to Congress in the 1800s and it got thrown out, which prevented a lot of California Indians from being recognized and they were not treated as sovereign nations when they were encountered because of the gold rush. And so those tribes, they've continued to exist as tribes kind of outside of the government's recognition but they should be federally recognized tribes and they should be able to acquire land in their traditional land base back. So that's kind of what it's about. But the reason that the, the, those treaties weren't ratified that should have been to recognize all of those California Indian tribes was because of the gold rush of 1849, because people wanted to move in, find ways to uh, remove and get rid of the Indians, which was by, mercenaries killing them. It was also um, um, government sanctioned and paid for by bonds per head, per scalp that the mercenaries got, um, who were largely settlers um, 
who wanted the land. And there's a definite connection to what happened all the way over here, 3,000 miles away in California, 160 years ago, and what's happening right now with the de-establishment in Mashpee. So um, would you, could you um, illuminate <laughs> that connection between the gold rush and our tribes not having recognition or their land base and the de-establishment of the Mashpee Reservation? Well, I, I do think it's, I think it's very important to highlight that um, all tribes are going through very similar situations. Um, and like we said, it's all about money and capitalism and uh, you know power and gain from certain groups of people. So I'm not surprised that although you know we are on different coasts and at different times, but we're still all going through the same struggles. Um, just to acquire our land and keep our land and be recognized for um, being Native American and being being Indian. I mean, the system was set up um, in our favor. Um, it was set up to help tribes um, continue to be self-sufficient. And really, it, it keeps going backwards, you know, one step ahead, two steps backwards because of certain people's ignorance and um, personal biases and opinions on what it is to be Indian or what it is to um, be deserving of land, if you will. Um, so I think that's wrong. We should just stick to the facts um, and allow tribes to be sovereign entities. Well, it's almost like people in America want to stick to American values for equality, and fairness and our our federal government and our supreme court will say yes tribes were here you deserve your land you deserve to self-govern and then sometimes um there will be competing interests rooted in capitalism and in the case of the mashpee um wampanoag tribe uh, what i read doing my homework is that um the tribe was getting ready to determine your economic futures by uh, building a casino nearby and it's Cape Cod near Boston. Lots of people go there and yet um, that would have competed with other casino interests who, that are non-native owned that would have not wanted their customers to be siphoned off to a tribe, basically, to support yeah. the tribe, which is just, and because of that, they have probably some sway or influence in the federal government. We know that our, our elected uh, POTUS right now is definitely in favor of economic development for certain people and certain groups of people overall costs to the point of right now we're in COVID and he just made an announcement that we're gonna open up the government economically and jobs in the country as soon as possible over the health of everybody. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Again, so we're dealing with the idea that a tribe could actually be profitable, that a tribe could um, have an economic development venture that could be um, pros that could just affect the tribal community in beautiful, successful ways for generations to come. We're talking about an opportunity for the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe to to have a little bit of money in their pocket by having a casino and you know that's not something new it's being done all over the country and it has proven to benefit tribes and tribal members favorably you know using the profits uh, to go right back into the community for educational purposes or other businesses um, or housing, you know, what have you. And so we had the opportunity to do that. And we started down that road and it was still um, just in its inception. And we started to, you know, put things in place and, um, and, and get those ideas and, and have them become a reality. And the part that really hurts is that this was a beautiful time for our tribe. Um, our unification was really strong. Everybody was on the same page. You know, our um, community and economic 
or excuse me, our community and government center had just gone up. Um, we had 19 to 20 uh, departments where, you know, everybody was employed or, or becoming employed. I mean, things were, it was like a beautiful economic boom. And unfortunately, the idea of having a casino in Taunton, Massachusetts, um, was a threat to the neighbors, um, and particularly others who were putting up casinos in Massachusetts at the time, and that would have been Wynn, um, of Wynn Casinos, um, Steve Wynn. And, um, and we found out that Trump is good friends, you know, with Wynn. <laughs> and so he, it seems like, it seems too coincidental, but it seemed as if it was deliberate and a deliberate attack to stop us in our tracks from having a casino just so that we wouldn't thrive and his friend could and did and still is while we're picking up the pieces, you know, we're, tr you know, and we've gone backwards now. Um, we've had massive layoffs, you know, people are losing their homes. They've lost their jobs. You know, our community and government center is suffering, you know, and it's just really unfortunate because it's like, think of the amount of money that has been made by, you know, non-natives, particularly, white people in this country in my opinion and the little threat of you know a casino you know they took it away i just I'm, I'm just baffled by that i don't really even have the words to say that because that is extreme racism and and capitalism and favoritism and every ism that you can think of was just applied to our tribe and and it was just because of money you know and yeah. and like I mentioned, it's part of a very much longer American narrative of progress and success and this American myth of people pulling themselves up by their bootstraps and anybody can make it is a myth that's really, it's a story that's really only reserved for white people because white people, um, and I'm also largely white too, so I mean, White people have, I mean, have my, my European ancestors who came to this country benefited off native lands that were taken through pandemics like COVID, um, germ warfare, outright killing, um, cultural genocide like the termination era. And we also benefited from the wealth that came out of um, whether it be American slavery on the backs of people in, of color in the South or other types of slavery that were still slavery, but, um, but not labeled that, um, like our indentured Chinese mm -hmm. in California, people who built the railroads, people who worked in factories in the Northeast, who were paid below wages, the slavery that's going on right now with our migrant workers in all of our agricultural industry, making two, three dollars an hour. Um, we're benefiting off of that off of that slavery and there's a huge social justice component to this that keeps going on and the other thing on the table um, you didn't mention it but these narratives play into stereotypes that we're subconsciously or consciously aware of and that's this stereotype that native folks and people of color and making money and being financially successful don't mix and the reason that we have these stereotypes is to keep white folks in power and having all the money basically and so this is particularly, um, I don't know, I don't even have a strong enough word to say it, but it's, I'll just say it's problematic for the Wampanoag tribe because you, the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, because your tribe has been here. Um, it, I mean, it's, it's been in the Northeast for over 12,000 years mm -hmm. at least. And your tribe has been there and you've continued despite all of this genocide, despite, despite being cast aside, despite surviving so many epidemics in your land being taken. But um, one of the survival strategies that your tribe has had has been to be able to um, integrate different people into the tribe, um, whether it be through intermarriage, living alongside each other. So it's a really a multiracial tribe. And I think that that's really problematic. There's a lot of multiracial tribes 
in the US and those tribes like the Lumbee, for example, have trouble having federal recognition and acknowledgement that you've had your continued traditions for hundreds and hundreds of years because the lawmakers and policymakers, they see um, African roots, other roots that are integrated into your tribe and they say, no, it's like their mind doesn't compute that you could be native and interracial which makes it easier for them to pass these policies like this. I agree. I completely agree. Um, I, in, in my opinion, two uh, major themes um, are really sticking out that rule this issue. And to me, it's capitalism and racism. And I agree. We go so hand in hand in America. <laughs> and it's nothing new. It's absolutely nothing new. Um, and I am so proud of the Mastery Wampanoag tribe and my ancestors for being so resilient um, and keeping our tradition and our culture and our land alive and holding on to that while integrating, while being, you know, just citizens of the United States. And so it's like we weren't and we are not geographically isolated. Um, we have to interact with other human beings, um, other races, other cultures, but we are, we keep our culture alive because that is who we are. And so although we might have different, um, different genetics and different blood and different, you know, races running through us over time, I mean, that to me is normal and natural for people to intermix. Um, you know, you can't choose who you love. And so we don't impose any sort of blood quantum um, for our membership and citizenship uh, requirements. Instead, it's about uh, lineal descent and it's cultural involvement. And um, we highly stress the cultural involvement. That is like a very uh, scrutinizing test, if you will, for those who are attempting to apply for membership. You know, like it's not a club. Um, it's, it's we're a culture and we're, we are alive and um, we take it very seriously, but so what's happening though, and what has happened is yes, on the surface, you have policymakers and lawmakers and, you know, um, these elected leaders look at us and they say, maybe in their minds or even out loud as Trump once did, you know, they don't look Indian. And that is not, our Indian status is not up for debate. Like it's not, um, it's not someone nobody should have the right to determine if we're Indian or not. That's up to us, you know, and we have proven that over and over again by being on our lands and um, having our culture that is distinct from American culture, having our religion that is distinct, having um, just our, our, just our separate, what makes us separate and what has allowed us to thrive over time. But I think the part that really troubles me is the uh, internalized racism that is in effect or is uh, a symptom of that. Um, and that happens in our tribe. And that's something that I don't like to see. Um, it's, you know, almost this crab in a barrel um, mentality sometimes because some of us have bought into this idea that oh, you know, you don't deserve this, or you're not Indian, or, or, you know, and that's just because of the racism that's imposed on us collectively, if that makes sense. And yeah. so, so that's something that I would love to see dissolve. And the way that will dissolve is if the rest of the world and, you know, the rest of the nation, and if the federal government just treats us equally, like other natives, you know, um, stop discriminating against us um, because of the way we look or how you feel about how we look. We're proud of who we are. Um, and yes, we have um, intermixed with um, slaves, black slaves who were here in the area, with um, Cape Verdeans, with Brazilians, with white people. I mean, it's all, it's all good. You know, I, it, we don't think that that's bad, but now all of a sudden when we don't fit in this box of, you know, having, um, certain characteristics and certain traits um now all of a sudden we are disadvantaged and that's not fair um you know we have 2800 members and i honestly can't even imagine what would happen to our tribe it would essentially dissolve if we impose any sort of blood quantum like 
you know, um, we don't think that that's a good, that's, that to me is the destruction of a tribe is, uh, yeah. those sort of limitations. Well, it's supposed to be the destruction of a tribe. The, in the 1934 Indian Reorganization Act, in order for tribes to get federal recognition, um, it said that all tribal members at, at that time, I, I may be wrong, but what I have in my head is that you had to have at least a quarter or more blood quantum to even apply um, for tribal recognition, whether or not people practiced their religion, their culture, lived on their land, it didn't matter. And blood quantum, this idea of blood, qua blood quantum <laughs> or purity, which is just fake pseudoscience of eugenics made up in the uh, 19th century in order to forward uh, colonialism and colonial empire and white supremacy. It, it's, it, a lot of people don't know that it worked the opposites for African Americans and Native Americans in the US throughout our history. If you're Native American, the less blood quantum you have, um, the more you don't exist and are not recognized for who you are. And the more we can get rid of uh, Native Americans, the more the land is open for everybody else to exploit. The opposite is true, obviously, for African Americans. Um, laws during the time of slavery and subsequently had said, you know, as little, you hear the drop of blood, the drop of blood saying that even if you have a drop of African American blood, then you're considered African American and all the discriminatory laws against you apply. So it's like these polar opposite ways of using the pseudoscience of eugenics work on racially mixed tribes like the Mashpee Wampanoag and other tribes in the U.S. to be, to, um, to deny your existence in two different ways. But yeah, you're still here. So I want to just, um, I want to, I just want to ask one last question about, um, so if, if the Mashpee Wampanoag can lose your, if your reservation can be taken away, can be di disestablished, as the legal term is that we started with, what does this mean? What could this lead to for the Mashpee, for other tribes, and what does this mean to all Americans? What should we be looking out for if, we, if this can be allowed to happen so blatantly? Well, if, if this can happen to us, then this will happen to other tribes. Um, that's why we need to stop this in its tracks. And as a unified uh, people, we need to say this is wrong and this should not happen. The federal government should not ever resort to this for any particular reason. Just because you can, you should not. Um, so I think that this could be, um, yeah, I'll stop there. Um, but I think that this is, this is very dangerous. Um, we don't want to get rid of our tribes. We want to empower our tribes and we want to um, just create more, more sovereign entities. I don't see, I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, and it's not just like a black white issue or a people of color issue. I think that there's a slippery slope here because of that extreme component of capitalism. Um, and the extreme inequality we've been experiencing, especially in the last 15 years in the US. And even after the 2008 economic meltdown, we saw inequality just continue to be on the rise with CEOs in America making 500% of the salaries of regular working people. And I think that regular working people need to know that if this is the types of laws and policies that our federal government is gonna pass, we're also gonna pass laws and policies that do things like lessen the power or totally eliminate things like unions for working class white folks, for people in the service industries to protect wages. We already don't have health care. We already have so many, the lack of so many rights while such a few people have so much money. So we really need to keep an eye on these types of policies as they go down and not think about it as, oh, this is just something that's affecting a tribe 
in Massachusetts of 2,800 members. This is something that is a slippery slope. If we allow this to happen, we can allow 100 other policies that affect 100 other people who aren't at the top of the pecking order <laughs> in America, I think. So we really all need to kind of be vigilant and like you said, write our senators and keep an eye on these things. Oh, I, I completely agree. Our, our collective reaction will determine you know, the next move from the federal government. Yeah. Um, or, you know, and it'll determine, they'll see how woke we are or not, you know. Um, so that's why this isn't just, like you said, it's not just affecting tribes, it's not just like an Indian issue. Um, we're almost like the guinea pigs, possibly, or, you know, the testing ground for what else can be slipped away. And so yeah. I agree, this matters to everybody. So I think people just need to pay attention and um, make their voice heard and, and spread, this, spread this news that is happening and, and care. You know, I mean, yeah. there is so much going on in the world in this, you know, age of information, but this is something that people actually should get behind and care about um, because it's a human rights issue. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people are worried about a lot of things right now. A lot of people have lost their jobs. A lot of people are trying to work and homeschool at the same time, but you can even write your senator the time you used to spend commuting <laughs> probably take 10 minutes. So I just want to end by saying, um, what are some other things that people can do? And um, if can people go to your website for some sample language of what to write? And what is that? Absolutely. So I did take some time and I wrote a a Senate template letter. Um, and I also posted that um, alongside the Senate directory on my website, which is www.heron, H E R O N, hyphen hill, H I L L dot org. And it's in my blog post um, that is titled The Disestablishment of uh, Mashby Lands. But I've made it very easy. You know, because sometimes people don't know what to say. They don't think that they have the words to say. Um, and this is really just uh, cut and dry about the facts, about supporting the bill, you know, and about um, the ramifications uh, to the tribe if this happens. You know, this would affect our language school. This would affect our housing projects. This would affect our uh, tribal government and the many um, services that it offers to tribal members. And this also affects other tribes, as we've said over and over again. So I've made it very easy. I, the goal is to get letters to every single senator, multiple letters to every single senator, um, so that they are aware and that they know their constituents care and are aware as well. The other thing is that um, we do have some uh, other virtual, for now, um, virtual prayer protests that we're planning. Um, there are a series of events that are happening for the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower and the pilgrims arriving. And so there are um, events that are um, coordinated throughout this year. And that is on the, um, the Plymouth400.org website. There are both uh, native events happening and um, pilgrim events happening, if you will. <laughs> um, <laughs> There's also the arrival of the Mayflower in Boston Harbor. That's May 15th. Um, and, oh, excuse me, that's May 14th. And um, there will be a series of events happening around that. Um, and so it's basically just uh, attuning your ears. I can interject. I think it's, uh -huh. it's just so, again, historical patterns. The mm -hmm. Mayflower is going to arrive in the middle of a pandemic, just like it did 400 years ago. I can't okay. even... <laughs> So that's why we have to really be conscious of our reactions. I, I, I don't want this happening over and over again. Um, and so this is our time to work together collaboratively as the ancestors of the pilgrims, as the ancestors of, you know, the Wampanoag nations. Like we need to um, do what is right and carry it forth. Um, we're also working collaboratively with the Dream Warriors, and we do have a webinar scheduled for April 19th from 5 to 7 p.m. Um, uh, from 5 to 7 p.m. Eastern Time, I'm sorry. So those are all uh, 
recent events that we are working on and we just want everybody to be involved and share. Well, I just really want to thank you for taking the time to talk to me about this issue and um, I'm going to stay abreast of this and it's a really, really important issue. I mean, just for, like I said, the first time in 60 years that the U.S. government has tried to take things like this away from tribes to um, disestablish you from your land, your self-determination, and strip away the tribe's sovereignty, basically. So I hope that we can get a lot of people together to be aware of this issue and also the connections this is an important time for all Americans to think about the connections between us um, trying not to get sick and die from a pandemic and our native ancestors. Um, I mean, as recently as my great grandmother dying from a flu pandemic um, and for hundreds of years, now all Americans can understand at least how novel germs affected our communities and begin to empathize with the impact that that really had and how that relates to the settling of America and how we all live here now and enjoy, you know, the beautiful country and lands and its amazing resources that we live on. So um, with that, um, thank you very much. And I'm going to say goodbye for now.